In the fourth module of this program, we will focus on the clinical effects of surfactant deficiency and inactivation. After completion of this module, participants will be able to discuss risk factors for the development of respiratory distress syndrome and describe the clinical presentation of an infant with surfactant deficiency. To begin our discussion on the clinical effects of surfactant deficiency, let us consider a typical case. Imagine you are called to attend the delivery of a 25-week preterm infant. The antenatal course was complicated by gestational diabetes. The infant requires positive pressure ventilation and intubation in the delivery room with hy for hypoxia and significant work of breathing. The medical student on your team asks you what factors are likely contributing to the infant's respiratory distress. Let us consider this question. Prematurity is the greatest risk factor for respiratory distress syndrome caused by a deficiency of adequately functioning surfactant. Male gender is also a significant risk factor, along with Caucasian race. As early as 1976, national statistics data show, showing gender and race to be a risk factor for RDS were reported in pediatrics. Familial disposition also plays a role in RDS as well as cesarean section without labor. Cesarean section without labor has come up on a number of lists for RDS risk. We know that C-section without labor is a risk factor for transient tachypnea of the newborn with delayed clearance of amniotic fluid, but if the fluid remains and one requires oxygen support or positive pressure, this may result in inflammation and inactivation of surfactant. Perinatal asphyxia can lead to inactivation of surfactant as well as a result of inflammation. Infants of diabetic mothers are at risk for surfactant deficiency because maternal hyperglycemia delays surfactant synthesis, which can lead to delayed lung maturation. Infants with low levothyroxine levels in the setting of thyroid disease are at increased risk for surfactant deficiency because of lower surfactant production. Administration of thyroxine increases surfactant production. Inflammation with chorioamnionitis also increases the risk of RDS by inactivation of surfactant. Non-immune high drops is another risk factor for RDS as pleural effusions can interfere with surfactant production and may lead to inflammation. Additional RDS risk factors that are specifically related to secondary surfactant deficiency are pulmonary infections and hemorrhage that may lead to inflammation or debris formation and inactivation of surfactant. The same case is true for meconium aspiration syndrome and oxygen toxicity. In a patient who has a congenital diaphragmatic hernia and subsequent pulmonary hypoplasia, there is a decrease in healthy lung tissue on both the hernia side and the contralateral side, leading to insufficient and ineffective production of surfactant. There are also genetic disorders that can affect surfactant production and function. Some conditions that have been identified include surfactant protein B deficiency, an autosomal recessive condition causing a loss of function mutation and is fatal without lung transplant. Surfactant protein C deficiency is autosomal dominant or sporadic and causes gain of toxic function, which is a new or enhanced activity of a protein that is deleterious to that cell with variable clinical outcome. ABCA3 is a membrane transporter of the adenosine triphosphate binding cassette family located on the membrane of lamellar bodies and is important in transporting phospholipids into lamellar bodies. Autosomal recessive disorders in ABCA3 frequently cause severe respiratory failure. Deletions or mutations in the NKX2.1 gene can result in a phenotype of RDS or severe interstitial lung disease, as well as abnormalities of the CNS, specifically chorea, and the thyroid gland, specifically hypothyroidism. This gene is important for expression of surfactant-related genes, including ABCA3, and the four surfactant proteins. This figure presents outcomes of patients with several of these genetic surfactant disorders. On the x-axis is age, and on the y-axis is the specific genetic mutation. The bars show the number of patients with the condition who are alive, transplanted, or who have died. Please note the very high rates of early lethality in surfactant protein P deficiency and ABCA3 deficiency, with the majority of subjects deceased by three months of age. Surfactant protein C has a variable outcome with a small number of individuals dying early on, but others surviving into adulthood with no symptoms of disease. There are several tests used to determine fetal lung maturity. Lamellar body counts are currently the most common test used for assessing fetal lung maturity as they are a measurement of surfactant protein production by type 2 pneumocytes. A hematology analyzer can be used to quantify lamellar bodies because of the similar size of lamellar bodies and platelets. 
values less than 15,000 per microliter are almost always associated with lung immaturity. Values greater than or equal to 50,000 per microliter strongly suggest lung maturity. Results are typically affected by the presence of blood, but not meconium. Phosphatidylglycerol is a constituent of surfactant. It begins to increase significantly in amniotic fluid after 35 weeks. Phosphatidylglycerol increases the spread of phospholipids in alveoli. Therefore, its presence indicates an advanced state of fetal lung development and function. Depending on the technique used, phosphatidylglycerol testing can be very time consuming, but faster running assays are available. This test is not affected by the presence of blood or meconium. The concentrations of lecithin and sphingomyelin in amniotic fluid are similar until 33 weeks of gestation. At 33 weeks, the concentration of lecithin begins to increase while the sphingomyelin concentration stays the same. Increased relative concentrations of lecithin are indicative of lung maturity. Performing this test can also be time consuming and complex. Its results are affected by both blood and meconium. Overall, these three tests have strong positive predictive value when the test deems fetal lungs mature. However, the predictive value is significantly lower when the test demonstrates that the lung is immature. Lamellar body counts and lecithin sphingomyelin ratios are more often used in clinical practice. Premature infants with surfactant deficiency exhibit symptoms of respiratory distress syndrome or RDS. Preterm neonates are at greatest risk for RDS. This condition was previously known as hyaline membrane disease due to the fact that a membrane containing proteins and dead cells line the alveoli, negatively impacting gas exchange. After initial improvement with, with resuscitation and stabilization, an uncomplicated course of RDS is often characterized by a progressive worsening over 48 to 72 hours. With the period of worsening, there is often an increase in FiO2 requirement and ventilatory support needs. Recovery usually coincides with a diuresis after the initial period of algorrhea. This typical chest x-ray as shown on this slide shows the triad of radiographic findings including hypoexpansion, a homogeneous reticular granular pattern in the lung fields, often referred to as a ground glass appearance, with su superimposed air bronchograms. In more severe cases, there is complete whiteout of the lungs. Clinically, these findings lead to impairment of the infant's ability to oxygenate and ventilate due to poor compliance, decrease in functional residual capacity, and atelectasis. Infants are tachypnic and demonstrate other signs of respiratory distress, such as nasal flaring, retractions, and grunting. Surfactant deficiency is diagnosed clinically based on the combination of work of breathing, oxygen ventilation requirements, chest x-ray findings, and associated risk factors. In patients with RDS, there is significant decrease in lung compliance. Compliance is the change in volume in, in milliliters divided by the change in pressure in centimeters of water. As you can see in the figure representing the normal pressure volume curve, when there is an increase in pressure, there is a resultant increase in the volume of air delivered to the lungs. However, in lungs with RDS or hyaline membrane disease, see the curve on the bottom of the figure, an increase in distending airway pressure results in a minimal increase in resultant volume delivered. The lack of surfactant increases surface tension so that an increase in pressure doesn't increase lung volume. Thus, an infant with RDS may need increased pressure initially to expand the alveoli. Pulmonary surfactant is critical for lung function and is Im implicated in respiratory distress syndrome in preterm infants. Multiple factors increase the risk for surfactant deficiency or inactivation, most notably prematurity, ethnic background, familial disposition, and IDM status. Specific genetic mutations which affect surfactant function have been identified. Clinical features of surfactant deficiency or RDS include respiratory distress, increased oxygen requirement, and characteristic radiographic findings, which present shortly after birth. This concludes Module 4. Thank you for your attention. We would like to acknowledge the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Organization of Neonatology Training Program Directors, NEO Reviews, and Abbott Nutrition for their support of this educational program. This concludes this module.